critical process. Step number two, gather the facts. Why? To keep emotions at bay. Have facts and figures. What is the cost of owning a home? What is my current income? What are the projections in the next five or ten years for me to own that home? Step number three, identify the alternatives. What alternatives are before my table? There is renting a house, there is building a house, there is buying a house, and if you decide to buy, there are many more options where to buy. If you decide to build, options are a million and one. Is it a two bedroom? Is it a seven bedroom house? Is it wooden? Is it brick? Then brainstorm on the options. That means you're thinking critically now through the merits and demerits of every option. Step number five, evaluate every alternative against its consequences, far-reaching consequences. Ten years from now, what is likely to become of the decision that I am making? You know, I have enough people I know who buy a house and three years later it is auctioned. Why? Because they pulled the name faith into this thing. And the Bible says, my people perish due to lack of knowledge. And I'm here to share this knowledge with you. Step number six, select the best option. You have done your evaluation very well, now select it. Step number seven, implement action. Don't leave it at the decision level, action it. Step number eight and the last one, now evaluate the outcomes of the decision you made. I suggest even check the implementation modality. This will inform your future decision-making processes. It will enhance your skills while making decisions. Look at my eyes right now, each one of you. I'm gonna give you a secret. This is for men, men only. Are there men in the house? I'll tell you something that worked for my house. It works 100% of the time in terms of making decisions. Engineer, try this, it works. It works. I'll tell you what Master and I decided to do in terms of making decisions in our home. A very simple formula. We agreed long ago, Master is going to make all the minor decisions. I'm going to make all the major decisions. Hmm. Carol, you're single. I make the major decisions. So we agreed Master is going to make all the minor decisions. So which decision does she make? She decides what we're going to eat. She decides what we're going to dress. She decides where we are going to live. She decides where we are going to stay. She decides where we are going for holiday. She even decides our career. She decides where our students will go to school, what time we are going to sleep or wake up. She decides our clothes. She decides all those things. And that frees my mind to make major decisions. Yesterday night, I just made one major decision. Should Kenyan troops withdraw from Sudan? <laughs> <laughs> Should we attack Somalia? You know, major decisions. Now I'm about to decide whether Putin is affecting Donald Trump. And you have a lot of peace. Man, if you just make those major decisions, you have a lot of peace. Leave the minor decisions. Concentrate with international affairs. <laughs> it works 100% of the time. All right, that aspect of choices. Are you there? I'm going to look at common choices we make. Common choices we make. I read of a story of a cowboy who went to church and then he realized it was only him and the preacher in the church. Nonetheless, he decided to sit down. The preacher left the pulpit and went down to the cowboy and asked him, you realize it's only you and I in the church? Do you want me to continue with the sermon? The cowboy looked at the pastor and said, well, I'm not a very smart guy, but if I went to feed my cows and only one of them turned up, I'll still feed him. The pastor interpreted that to mean he should go ahead with the message. He preached for an hour, two hours two and a half hours. Then he came to the cowboy and asked him how was the message. The cowboy said, as I told you earlier, I'm not a very smart guy, but I know if I went to feed my cows 
and only one of them turned up. I will not give him all the hay. <laughs> now, so I don't want to give you all the hay because we have more than 10 million choices to make. I'm only going to tell you four of them because there are too many. Is that okay? I'm only going to discuss four. And the first one I'm going to discuss is about the choice of a spouse. The second common choice I'm going to discuss is sex decisions. The third one I'm going to discuss is career decisions. And the fourth one I'm going to discuss is money decisions. I chose these three, those four, and you are going to learn why, because these are decisions we make almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's start with the first one, the choice of a spouse. Now, as a matter of curiosity, how many in this live audience do not have a spouse? For whatever reason, whether you're single or widowed, for whatever reason, you do not have a spouse. You're divorced, you're widowed, you're single. You're living on a promise, but you're not married. Please lift up your heart. Okay, you don't even have a promise. Lift up your heart. Quite many. Now, what I'm going to share in the next few moments may not be applicable to every one of us, but it's also true some of us may reach there one time. The Lord forbid. But I also know we are going to help about 40% of those who turned up and hundreds of thousands who are going to listen to this video recording. There are, I'm going to suggest seven things to consider, and I don't want to pretend that the list is exhaustive. But this is going to guide you. Number one, don't act out of fear. A lot of single people, especially after they hit the age of 30, they begin to panic and they make hasty decisions. The more a decision is made in haste, the more likely you're going to make a permanent mistake. The less pressure you put on yourself, the more positive energy you exhibit and the more the chances to attract the right person to your life. So I suggest if you're single, go ahead with your career development. Buy that lad if you can. Buy that house if you can. Concentrate and focus on your life. Don't preoccupy with your head looking for Mrs. Wright and Mr. Wright. You are more beautiful when you're not under pressure. There is no designated age for marriage. Be on the move. Number two, don't jump into a committed relationship. Don't jump into a committed relationship. Especially the ladies in our midst, please hear me as God's servant. I can't even tell you how many people write to me almost every single week saying they have been conned, they have been cheated, they have been played. Even in our midst, I can see some of you here who've written to me in the last two, three weeks. And when I ask them two, three questions, they fail on the very first acid test. I ask them a very simple question. Has that man taken you to his parents? Do you know his home? No then what on earth made you believe he's serious with you? If a man is serious with you, he's going to introduce you to his family. That is the only place he cannot pretend and you're going to see him in his true colors. I guarantee you, you will continue reaping sorrows if you engage committed relationships. Refuse to buy the idea that stolen waters are sweeter and go for your own person. The third consideration. Don't expect someone to change after you tie the knot. Don't expect someone to change after you tie the knot. A lot of daters tolerate a lot of crop from the person they are dating. And for some strange reason, they continue believing that he or she is going to change after the wedding day. So I find a young girl dating a guy who is physically and verbally abusing her, and she has the audacity to believe the guy is going to change after their wedding. You meet someone who drinks until past midnight, and you somehow believe that you're the person who is going to change him after the wedding. You are living in a rude shock. You are living in utopia. Come back to reality. Number four, 
Take time before being involved emotionally. Take time before being involved emotionally. Don't allow lust to be your guide. Don't involve yourself emotionally before you get involved logically. A lot of daters have a unique blindness, the blindness of the mind. Because of magnetic chemistry, they jump into emotions even before they get to know who they're dealing with. You know, the ideal situation, from my own advice, is to meet this individual four seasons twice. A year has four seasons. And I recommend twice. There is no emergency. It doesn't matter whether you're 42 years of age. You have already waited for 42 years. You might as well look for him and get to know him for the next two years. Because believe me, my sisters, my brothers, it is far better to remain single than to commit yourself to someone you have no clue where you're getting yourself into. Keep emotions out of this in the initial stages of the relationship. Any romance at the initial stages when the relationship is developing is fantasy and it's going to backfire. Number five, throw away your checklist. A lot of single people have a long list of what they're looking for. Please keep that away for high school children. You are no longer in high school. Forget about whether he tucks in his shirt or not. In fact, forget about whether he has earrings or not. Forget about whether she knows how to use cutlery or not. Some people are raised up in a place where they eat ugly using their fingers. Just forget about all that. And concentrate on higher ideals of integrity and kindness and honesty. Matters of lifestyle can be enhanced. Concentrate on the big picture. Number six, give a chance to people you would ordinarily never give a chance. Give a chance to people you ordinarily would never give a chance. Please, do not argue that she's not my type. Do not argue that he is not my type. Your type only exists in your head. It doesn't exist in this life. I'll never forget when we were in the university as students, especially girls in those days, they were looking up to some men who were pursuing perceived superior careers. So they wanted to get married to an engineer or a doctor or an architect. And I know some of them who are still single simply because they were looking for a certain career. Who here has been married by a career? Do you also recognize that success is not a matter of the career you did? Give people a chance. You know, when you're growing up, maybe you had a certain height you wanted of a man, seven foot, and the dude that appears to you is only five foot. Take him for coffee date. Anyhow, you see, still waters run deep, but you may never know unless you give them a chance. That's why he may be so near the ground, because he's deep. <laughs> Give them a chance. Number seven, look for someone you'll be comfortable to be in their presence. Look for someone you'll be comfortable to be in their presence. I'm saying this because I know some people who are married, but they never walk together as spouses. You will never see them together. Is that familiar? Because they're not comfortable with the person they married. They are not proud of the person they married. Someone who knows me for many years, like Erastas, Erastas knows me very closely for over 15 years. If you fight him after this meeting, he will tell you, I've never taken anyone for more dates, coffee, dinner, or otherwise, than my mercy. She is by far my best company. At any given moment to interact with my life, at any given moment to come to my life, it will not take you two months to come to that conclusion. Don't get someone you are afraid of introducing and you start saying, uh, this guy is a colleague, you know? <laughs> Be with someone you can be 100% comfortable with. Because this is the only place you cannot afford to put on a mask. Look for someone you can be yourself. You can't act for a lifetime. Married guys, married guys, this is for you. I have an advice for the married guys. 
Never laugh at your wife's choices. You are one of them. <laughs> All right. Oh. Common choice number two. Can you go to number two? Sex decisions. Sex decisions. Now, sex has been a subject of uh, jokes, ridicule, sometimes even mockery, than any other subject. Over the last two weeks, I was taking Sense 101 Life Club through a series of choices. And when we read the subject of sex, <laughs> wow, the traffic. <laughs> this subject is exciting. It has a lot of energy. And maybe I should pull out one joke from a man and one from a woman. I read a joke from a guy by the name Woody Allen. He said, I don't know the question, but sex is definitely the answer. No, no, I, I need to pull one from a woman by the name uh, Betty Frieden. There is not a single woman who got orgasm as a result of shining her kitchen floor. <laughs> now, Dr. Terry Fisher, a professor of psychology at Ohio State University at uh, Mansfield, uh, conducted a survey just to find out how we think about sex. And she concluded 54% of men think about sex that four times every day. I don't know what happened to the other 46%. I just suppose they are either too young or too old or too sick. <laughs> then she concluded, the average woman on an average day, she thinks about sex 18.6 times. So as you look at me right now with very holy eyes, the chances are very high, you have thought about sex since you came for this meeting. So how do we do with that information? Then we need to teach our children that it's normal to think about sex and we have to talk to them about making healthy sexual decisions because all young adults are going through the same issues. Ignoring the subject will not help them by any stretch of the imagination. You've got to teach your children that freedom without boundaries is madness. You've got to teach your children that sex is not just physical, it's also emotional, that's why it hurts. If sex were just physical, it were possible to avoid being hurt. But then you can't give what you don't have. So I need to speak to you first, so that you can speak to your children. Because every single day, we make sex decisions. Every single day. I'm gonna give you some advice in the form of questions, five of them. Number one, as you get involved in sex, ask yourself these five questions. Number one, can I repeat it indefinitely and be happy as a result of it? Can I repeat it indefinitely and be happy as a result of it? And that's the line between pleasure and happiness. That's the line between love and lust. True love can only be experienced where there are commitments. Otherwise, it's lust. Pleasure, generally speaking, is short-lived. Are you able to repeat what you're doing and be proud with yourself that you're doing it? Question number two. Am I doing this at the emotion of the moment? Am I getting involved at the emotion of the moment? Any sex decision that is made at the heat of the emotion is better left for some other day. If she sleeps with you on your very first date, I guarantee you, you are not the first one or the last one. If he sleeps with you or even suggests something close to that, you can buy this message. You are not his first, nor are you his last. If after getting involved intimately, it leaves you with post coitus depression, then you're involved emotionally. What's that? This is stress that comes after sexual intimacy. You start doing some calculations and math and wondering why you engaged in it. Then you have already made a wrong sex decision. Question number three. 
Is it fair to everyone concerned? Is it fair to everyone concerned? Is it fair to that other woman? Is it fair to that other man? Is it fair to my children? Is it fair to my family? Is it fair to the ministry that I am running? Because it can never just be a matter of me. Question number four. Does it take me closer to or further away from my goals in life? Does it take me closer to or further away from my other goals in life? The reason why we must interrogate this question is because sex is not your only goal in life. You've got other goals. Is this specific act conflicting my financial goals? Is it conflicting my other relational goals? Is it conflicting my family goals? Is it conflicting my relational goals? Is it conflicting my career goals? One single sex decision has ruined an entire church. One single sex decision has ruined an entire career. You've got to ask yourself, is this decision aligning itself with my other goals? Question number five on the last one. Have I set, defined, and communicated my boundaries clearly? Have I set, defined, and communicated my boundaries clearly? How far is too far for me? It's about me, not the other person, because these are my choices and I'm going to live by them. Is everybody around me clear about this? When you go for workshops out of town, different gender. Do you communicate to the people you are going out with your boundaries so clearly that they can't cross the borders? I'm going to tell you something that looks like a contradiction. You know, if you have already decided you're going to sleep with someone, it's your choice. You might as well enjoy it. There's no need you start selling lard and you're in bed. You have already decided. It's your choice. But listen at the quietest whispers of your mind. They will always tell you the best choices to make. I can see a doubting eye all over here. Doc, get real. Which world do you live in? Who does what you're saying these days? 